This is Dr. Tim Gambus in his teaching on the book of Galatians. This is session number four on Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. So this is the fourth lecture uh, in Galatians, and in this lecture we're going to cover Galatians 2, 11 to 21. Uh, first, uh, verses 11 to 14, where Paul recounts his uh, confrontation of Peter uh, in Antioch. And then in verses 15 to 21, uh, what Paul does there is he digs into the, the deep logic of the gospel, basically, that is his argument, that was his argument with Peter in Antioch, um, and really forms the logic of what he wants to argue with uh, the Jewish Christians there in Galatia and also the, the, well, the whole audience there in Galatia. Um, what Paul is doing here is he's bringing together um, the two situations, that is, the confrontation of Peter and Antioch, and uh, he's using that as basically the substance of his confrontation of his entire audience there in Galatia. So, he, you know, that, that situation with Peter, basically, he's conflating the two situations because they're the same thing. Um, now, there is an interpretive issue of whether verses 15 to 21 were actually part of the speech that he gave to Peter uh, there in Antioch, part of his confrontation. Um, it probably was. I mean, this is probably something of what he said there in Antioch. But really, it doesn't matter for our purposes because what Paul is doing is he's unfolding the theologic, or the theological logic, um, of what Jewish Christians, uh, Paul's contemporaries, need to understand about the gospel so they can participate in the fullness uh, of the fellowship of, of um, the one new multi-ethnic family of God in Jesus. So let's dig in and see what happens here, uh, what, the nature of Paul's argument. In verse 11, uh, verses 11 to 14, Paul recounts his confrontation of Peter. And he says in verse 11, when Cephas, and this is Peter, this is his, his, uh, uh, his Aramaic name, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now, this is not recorded in Acts, this visit of Peter um, to, um, to Antioch. Um, but, and I don't know why Peter made his way to, there to Antioch. Um, it was not necessarily like, a, I'm going to check you out and see that you're doing everything right, kind of a visit. But Paul doesn't comment on that. So Peter ends up there in Antioch. And re, you remember, the, an, uh, the Antiochian church is a mixed race church. There are Jews and Gentiles fellowshipping there together in Christ because they're enjoying their Christian identity together. The Jerusalem church was completely monolithic. It was Jewish. These are Jewish Christians, and because of that, all the Christians there in the Jerusalem church had not necessarily had to, they didn't necessarily have to work through the logic of the gospel, which would have led them to fellowship with non-Jewish Christians. They just didn't have the opportunity. They're all Jews who are Christians. Peter did have that opportunity um, because he was driven in Acts 11 um, to... Uh, meet with the, uh, the centurion in um, uh, Caesarea. Uh, but, uh, so Peter has had to work through this issue, but also it's the case that there's some sense in which you can sort of learn something theologically, but since you're not pressed to embody it practically, uh, sometimes that theological lesson is not always very deeply embedded. So Peter makes this visit uh, to Antioch, and Paul ends up having to oppose him because he stood in the place of judgment. He stands condemned. Well, why does he stand condemned? What did Peter do? Well, Paul recounts here in verse 12 that, first of all, he was eating with Gentiles. Um, that is to say, when the church gathered together, uh, Peter um, was gathering, was doing what they did in the Antiochian church. That is, they got together for the, the Lord's Supper or the love feast, uh, the, the meeting uh, as, as church, where they would have a meal together. And the Jews, the Jewish Christians and the non-Jewish Christians are all eating at the same table. They're eating together. Um, now, it's unknown whether the Jews would have had uh, kosher food. In my opinion, 
It's likely that the Jews would have, ate, uh, would have eaten kosher food, specially prepared food for them. Non-Jewish Christians would eat you know, whatever they were going to eat. Um, but what was important was that they sat at the table together, uh, which was a radical step beyond um, most Jewish Christians' inherited view of what's appropriate. Peter makes a uh, reference, uh, I didn't write down the passage here, but it's in his speech to um, the centurion in Acts 11 when he says that you know that it is unlawful for Jews to eat with Gentiles. So this is not in the law that it's unlawful to do so, but the way that they had regarded Torah was that it, they were prevented from actually sitting down and eating with Gentiles. So what they thought was unlawful um, these Jewish Christians in Antioch are pressing beyond that to live into the fullness of their Christian identity as part of Jesus' one new family. So Peter is enjoying that fellowship. He's eating with uh, non-Jewish Christians for a time, but certain men from James uh, came. And when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. That is to say, these men come down from Jerusalem, and um, these are Jewish Christians who regard, basically, um, fellowshipping with Gentiles as unlawful, either going into a Gentile's house or sitting down and eating food with Gentiles. And when they come down, Peter, because he's intimidated, begins to remove himself from fellowshipping with Gentiles, no longer eating with them. Um, basically fearing their disapproval of these men who are uh, from the Jerusalem church. Well, the effect of Peter's action is to send the message to the non-Jewish Christians that you have to become like us. To be Jewish is to be part of God's approved ethnic identity. And because you are sinners, you are not you know, of the same group that I'm a part of, you have to change and become like me or else I can't fellowship with you. So, um, this is an indication that social behaviors have theological meaning. Uh, very much the same, similar thing, uh, but the same basic thrust is going on in 1 Corinthians 11, when the rich are shutting out the poor from the love feast in Corinth, and Paul confronts them that they're not embodying Christian identity and Christian social community rightly. Um, when they shame the poor by shutting them out. Uh, because the inherent message is you're not good enough, we have greater social value than you have, meaning sort of we have more inherent value before God than you have. Same thing's happening here with Peter's action. Um, Paul says that this uh, is an act of hypocrisy uh, on the part of Peter. Um, verse 13, and the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Uh, which is interesting that Paul calls it hypocrisy. Why is it hypocrisy? Um, he doesn't comment on that. Um, but it, it, it very well may be the fact that Barnabas already knows better. He's already been part and parcel, a full participant in this mixed race uh, community in Christ. Peter knows better. Uh, as I just mentioned in Acts 11 and 12, he, uh, sorry, Acts 10 and 11, he goes to Caesarea um, and then even reports back the theological lesson that he learned uh, to the church in Jerusalem. So they know better. They know better, but they are intimidated by the presence of these people from the Jerusalem church um, that they are actually engaging in unlawful behavior. Um, and the unlawful behavior is that these Jewish Christians, um, under sort of um, under obligation to be law observant, are doing something that maybe is unlawful, but certainly feels transgressive, and are actually fellowshipping with people who are sinners. Um, what is going to get them out of this conundrum? What's going to get? Uh, a Jew, a Jewish Christian like Peter and Barnabas out of this trouble. This is what Paul embarks on in Galatians 2, 15 to 21, where he unfolds for a Jewish Christian like Peter 
like Barnabas and the Jewish Christians there in Galatia, he's unfolding for them the logic of the gospel, which explains how God's one new family in Christ actually can fellowship fully with one another. So let's take a look at how this unfolds. Um, as I said, this is probably part of um, Paul's speech to Peter that he gave him in Antioch, uh, but even if it, you know, parts of it are not exactly what he said, this is basically the theologic that Paul would have unfolded for Peter and uh, is going to be helpful for him. Before we get into this, though, uh, we have to get into a couple of uh, heavy theological issues. Or I should say, this text is basically one of these um, crucial texts that contain a lot of uh, Pauline theological um, issues that are up for grabs these days. Uh, so we'll have to cover a couple of these major exegetical issues in this passage and Pauline theology. First of all, justification comes up here in this text because Paul, to solve this problem of um, Jew and Gentile relationships in Christ, goes to justification. He uses justification to solve this problem. Um, what exactly does Paul mean by justification? Um, well, first of all, the first thing that we need to say about justification is that um, many people in our, well, many Christians today understand justification coming out of our Reformation heritage as referring uh, to the verdict that is rendered by God um, that a believer is justified or righteous at the point of that person's conversion. That is true. It's just that there's much more going on with justification. Um, it's a it's a big notion. It's a large notion. Uh, you remember, <clears throat> you remember when I had this one um, diagram up on the board here, uh, where I was talking. I made reference to how at the moment of Christ's death and resurrection, there is sort of an already component to salvation, but there's still a not yet component to salvation. Um, one of the things that's important to say about justification is that justification also partakes of that already but not yet dynamic. That is to say, justification, in a sense, justification is the eschatological verdict that God will render over his people at the day of Christ. Okay? Justification is a future reality. Um, Paul says in Galatians 5 that uh, we, uh, by the Spirit, await the hope of justification or the hope of righteousness because it's a notion that is going to happen in the future. Now, as it happens, um, a key component of Paul's theology is that the future day of Christ is already pressing in on the present and has, in a sense, overtaken the church, the believer, the church, uh, in the present era. So if you think about um, you know, the church is the collection of all the people who are in Christ here in time. The day of Christ, by the Spirit, the day of Christ is already secured to everybody who is in Christ in time. Um, Paul says that the, the, uh, you are the ones upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So there's a sense in which anybody who is in Christ... Anyone who turns to Christ and uh, receives salvation is baptized into Christ by the Spirit. There is a sense in which in the heavenly courtroom, a verdict of righteous is rendered, but that's a verdict nobody hears. That's a verdict that's rendered in anticipation of the future day of Christ, that verdict being wrung out publicly before the whole cosmos. So one of the things that we have to say about justification is it is a future reality that is, a, that is applied to believers in the present because we are the people uh, upon whom the future has fallen. Um, so it's eschatological. That is to say it has to do with things in the end. A further aspect to um, righteousness slash justification language, that's the same word group. Um, a further issue having um, that's part of this is that Justification has to do with being made right. Uh, it has to do with rectification. That is to say, something 
uh, you know, pre previous generations of uh, Pauline theologians would object that um, justification, it's, a, it's not right to say that it has no uh, effect in reality um, because then we're making it just a legal fiction that's wrung out in heaven. Uh, but for Paul, justification is to be rectified. That is to say, people outside of Christ are brought into the transformed, made new people of God. When we are justified, that is a making right. We are transformed. So there's the transformative aspect of justification. Uh, but one of the aspects that has, has most to do um, with, with this passage and how Paul unfolds his argument is that justification also has to do with inclusion in the people of God. That is to say, um, justification has to do with who is a part of God's people. Uh, in a sense, it answers um, who are the, who, who is the, what, sorry, what is the group of people that as we look forward to the future day of the Lord, what is the group of people that God is going to fully and finally justify at that day? What does that group of people look like? Various Jewish groups in the first century would have answered that question differently. Paul, according to Paul's gospel and those who are uh, the apostles, according to Paul's gospel, it is all those who are in Christ. Everyone who has faith in Christ or who is of the faithfulness of Christ. We'll talk about that in a second, another big interpretive issue. But everybody who is a follower of Jesus, um, whether they are Jew or Gentile, those are the people who are going to be justified at the final day. And those are the people who have a right uh, to be called the people of God and basically who have the right to, to, um, uh, to claim hope in being justified at the final day. Okay? That is a little bit up for grabs in this Galatian situation because what is being argued in Galatia by the Jewish missionaries, the Jewish Christian missionaries, is that no, the people who have the right to hope and be justified at the final day are people who are in Christ and look Jewish. People who are Jewish are going to be justified at the final day. And Paul is saying, no, the only basis for justification and thereby inclusion in the people of God is people who are of the faith of Jesus Christ, who walk in the same way uh, as Jesus walked. Those are the people who are going to be justified on the final day. So justification is a complex uh, reality, and there's a lot of issues tied up in that. And we'll see how that works out in Paul's argument as it unfolds here in verses 15 to 21. The second issue, uh, interpretive issue, is what does Paul mean by this expression, works of law? <clears throat> this expression, um, works of law, that Paul uses three times in verse 16. Um, and this is where this whole interpretive issue um, having to do with what is called the new perspective on Paul comes into play. And uh, what's happening here is, is um, previous generations of Paul and scholars looked at um, Paul's gospel as standing over against a legalistic uh, conception of Judaism. That is, Paul was proclaiming a law-free gospel, uh, whereas Judaism is depicted as legalistic. And the gospel comes in, um, Paul proclaims that it is by faith in Christ alone, not by doing or achieving or accumulating or earning merit. And when Paul uses the expression works of law, that's an expression that has to do with uh, works that are connected to the Mosaic law whereby one accumulates merit before God in order to present a claim to God for justification on the final day. So Paul here in Galatians 2.16 is advocating for faith in Christ over against works of law by which he means deeds of legalism. Uh, more recently, uh, it's been argued that Paul by this expression, works of law, is not talking about deeds of legalism. What he's talking about is the kinds of deeds that a person does um, oriented by Torah or oriented by the Mosaic law, deeds such as Sabbath observance, um, following food laws in the preparation of food, um, circumcision, the kind of deeds um, that, that represent loads of other deeds in, in observance of the Mosaic law, but that add up to a life 
that makes one a Jew. So Paul is not talking, when he, when he uses this phrase, works of law, he's not talking about legalism. He's, ta- he's speaking about the deeds that a person can do that mark him out as a Jew or mark her out as a Jew. Uh, acts that add up to a Jewish identity. And that, that notion has, has great merit, I believe, because these are the kinds of things that Paul's actually talking about in this context. He's talking about differences between Jews and Gentiles. And in verse 15, that's how he begins this discussion. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Um, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. So works of law stands in, in there for Jewish identity. Paul and Peter are Jews, but they know that doing the things that add up to a Jewish identity is not the basis of justification. They know that the basis of justification is faith in Christ and that by itself. So the second thing, uh, the second interpretive issue is that works of law has to do with Jewish identity. It does not have to do with with, uh, uh, Judaism as a legalistic religion. Third, the third interpretive issue, and this uh, again is is tangled, Um, this expression, uh, faith in Christ Jesus, is a little bit more complicated in verse 16 uh, and beyond uh, than you might imagine. Uh, Paul uses a Greek expression here that I'll get rid of some of this. Uh, Paul uses a Greek expression here. Pistis Yesu Christu, uh, by which he means, by which he's indicating, um, well, here's the question, what exactly is Paul indicating? Uh, for, for many English Bible readers, it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, one of the ways that this expression can be understood is as an objective genitive and translated in this way the way that you are probably used to seeing it. Faith in Jesus Christ or faith in Christ Jesus. Um, Another way of translating this, however, and many interpreters argue that this is more natural, is this is a subjective genitive and has to do with the faith, and this might sound a bit unnatural if you're just used to reading Romans and Galatians in English translation, is this having to do with the faith of Jesus Christ or the faith of Christ Jesus. And then the question is raised, well, what, what need does Jesus have to, you know, to exercise faith? Um, furthermore, pistis can be rendered or translated faithfulness. Um, something like faithfulness, fidelity, loyalty, trust, that sort of thing. So Paul is not necessarily contrasting here internal faith with external deeds. Um, the contrast has something more to do with something having to do with Jesus Christ and his faithfulness, or faith in Jesus Christ, on one side, and on the other side, Jewish identity when it comes to justification. Um, So interpreters have debated uh, whether this expression has to do with justification coming by the agency of Jesus Christ and his faithfulness, emphasizing perhaps divine initiative uh, in salvation, or Is Paul talking about the human responsibility in salvation and um, the human's responsibility to exercise faith in Christ Jesus? This has been uh, one of the big occupations of um, Pauline theology over the last um, the last 30, 40 years or so. Um, It's an issue that's often related to new perspective kind of issues, but it's actually a very distinct and separate issue because the lines fall in, in different places with regard to this debate. Um, I think one of the best treatments of this, uh, or at least one of the ones that that captures my own understanding, is that by Morna Hooker, who recently wrote an article uh, indicating that it's probably the best way to read this expression as emphasizing both. I mean, Paul perhaps means to be ambiguous here. Um, That is to say, what Paul is trying to emphasize is that justification comes by Jesus Christ's faithfulness to the Father, by the the life that he led, 
and his mission of faithful obedience all the way to the cross. Um, that is the means whereby God unleashes justification. Furthermore, um, and we see this uh, especially when it comes down to verse 20, where Paul talks about his life being wrapped up into the faithfulness of the Son of God, or the faith in the Son of God, however you translate that expression, uh, because the same issue applies there. But there, Paul does talk about the human, um, about human participation in the faithfulness of Jesus. So does Paul mean to actually capture both Jesus Christ's faithfulness to the Father and that mode and that life of faithfulness as sort of the template that we, that we imitate, but also the realm of reality that we jump into and are baptized into by the Spirit and that carries us along as we render to God a life of faithfulness, um, being empowered by Jesus' life of faithfulness and imitating Jesus' life of faithfulness. I hope that makes sense. I sort of take a both-and approach um, where this has to do with justification coming uh, by virtue of my being incorporated into Jesus Christ. And I also like the participatory dimension where the faithfulness of Jesus Christ actually sets the parameters and is the template for my own life of faithfulness, even as my life is wrapped up into the life of Jesus. So these three interpretive issues are going to come into play uh, at, at many points as we make our way through uh, Galatians 2. 15 to 21, and Galatians 2, 15 to 21 is really the theological heart of this letter um, and is the theological core of what he wants to communicate to his audience. So having kind of covered that to some extent without hopefully losing anybody, uh, let's get back into the text. Um, Paul's strategy here in this passage is to lump together uh, the Jewish Christians there in Galatia, uh, and Peter, and Barnabas, as all making the same error. And so Paul's theological message in 2.15 to 21 is what he wants to say to all of them. Let's see how his logic works out. Um, in verses 15 and 16, Paul starts with agreed upon notions that Paul, Peter, Barnabas, and we'll assume that the Jewish Christians in Galatia all share. They share these, verses 15 and 16 are basically the common confession of Jewish Christians of Paul's era. And here's what he says. We are Jews by nature. That is, you, Peter, and Barnabas, and me, Paul, I, Paul, we are Jews by nature, by birth, and not sinners from, from among the Gentiles. And when Paul says that, um, there's a sense in which he's being a little bit obnoxious. Um, he's drawing out all the implicit notions that are in play here and making them explicit. And he's really being a bit racially charged um, because the way that um, first century Jews would look on Gentiles was to see them as inherently unclean, inherently sinners. Um, and that fellowship with them makes... Um, a Jew like Paul or Peter makes them unclean. So, I mean, it's, you know, they're looking down their, their nose in judgment at Gentile sinners. So Paul is saying, you, Peter, and I, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Yet, or but, or nevertheless, knowing that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, that is to say, even though you and I um, are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, we know, Peter, that the ground or the basis for inclusion in the people of God, or the ground or the basis for justification before God, is not our Jewish identity, but is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, or God's provision for us in Christ, something like that. Um, so what, what he's trying to do here in the first sort of two lines of verse 16 is he's wanting to say to Peter, um, even though we are not Gentile sinners and we are Jews, we still know that it's not our Jewishness that saves us. It's not our Jewishness that justifies us. It's our inclusion 
into Christ's own faithfulness. Or if you like, it is our faith in Christ, not our Jewishness. Because of that, we also have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by the faithfulness of Christ or by faith in Christ and not by being Jewish. So he's repeating himself. He's kind of elaborating at length on the logic here so that Peter really gets it. Um, I'll paraphrase this. We also have believed in Christ or committed ourselves to Christ so that we may be included in the people of God on the basis of the faithfulness of Christ and not because of our Jewish identity since simply maintaining Jewish identity doesn't bring about justification. That's so, so, so far, that's kind of the logic of verses 15 and 16. And what Paul is doing is he's drawing out sort of at painful length the logic and laying it bare um, of Jewish Christianity, the gospel as Jewish Christians would know it. Um, Peter, Barnabas, and himself, and those Jewish Christians in Galatia. And the point is this so far. Jews are on the exact same ground as Gentiles with regard to justification before God. Jews are on the same basis as Gentiles with regard to justification before God. Theologically, we're cool, but watch what Paul does this with Peter. Paul then isolates and makes explicit Peter's difficulty which is the same difficulty as Barnabas is, the same difficulty as the Jerusalem Christians, and is the same difficulty as the agitators in Galatia. And here it is in verse 17. If, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? Or I could paraphrase it this way. If putting ourselves next to the rest of humanity before God for justification includes us next to all these sinners, is Christ doing some work for sin, the, the cosmic power of sin? That is to say, um, remember what the logic of verses 15 and 16 is. Jews are on the same basis as Gentiles with regard to justification before God. So these Gentile Christians and these Jewish Christians, Paul would be saying to Peter, what Jesus just did for us uh, is the thing that you fear. And you fear rubbing shoulders with sinners, making you unclean. Right? That's, that's not a good thing. Well, Jesus, God in Christ, just did that to us. Because he set us next to all these Gentile sinners um, standing in need of justification before God. So we are standing shoulder to shoulder with other Gentile Christians whom we are being told uh, to regard as sinners. So is Jesus in league with sin? That's the conundrum. That's the theological problem. And of course, Paul says, may it never be. That's, a, that's an absurd conclusion. That's an absurd conclusion. But that's really the logic that uh, Peter and Barnabas and the Jerusalem Christians and the, Gent uh, the agitators in Galatia, that's the, that's the conclusion they're, they're pushed to. And Paul wants them to see that that's absurd. Something else has got to be going on. So to get them out of that problem, uh, Paul unfolds this, this uh, theological logic, and he's going to unfold this logic uh, with two elaborations, um, one in verse 18 and then one in verses 19 and 20, and they're both set off by these, con like I said before, these gorgeous conjunctions. There's two fours, excuse me, there's these two fours that um, set off Paul's two elaborations. The first one he gives here in verse uh, 18, and this is, uh, is very, very cryptic. Very, very cryptic. And may I have, whenever I, something is complicated for me, I have to draw it. So I'll see if I can draw this, the logic here. Paul says this in verse 18. For, that is to say, here's why this is not a problem, Peter. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. 
What in the world is Paul saying? If I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. And what Paul is doing here in verse 18 is he wants Peter to understand, and also the agitators, the teachers in Galatia, he wants them to understand that um, what they're doing, driven by their fear of, of uh, fellowshipping with Gentile sinners and thereby becoming unclean, what they're doing, driven by that fear, is putting them in a far more precarious situation before God than what, they're, what they think they're avoiding. Okay? Here's what I mean by that. The lo- uh, I could paraphrase verse 18 this way. If you... Peter, agitators, Jerusalem Christians, if you really do act out your Jewish Christianity the way you're doing, you become worse than a sinner. You become a transgressor. You become a high-handed sinner against God. Now, how is that the case? Here's how that is the case. Um, Paul talks about rebuilding what he has once destroyed. And what Paul, I think, is doing here is he's regarding, um, uh, well, I don't, really, I don't even know if I want to say the law itself because the law didn't necessarily teach this. But what Paul has understood uh, to be lawful or unlawful is to be fellowshipping with Gentiles. And this is what Peter talked about in Acts uh, 10 and 11. That is, it is unlawful to be fellowshipping with Jew, uh, Jews and Gentiles, or to be fellowshipping as Jews with Gentiles. Um, you can picture their understanding of the law as a fortress. In fact, maybe I'll put this in quotes. The law. Because the Mosaic law actually didn't do this in a sense, but uh, Peter and Paul formerly thought that it did this. The law was sort of functioning as a fortress, keeping them in. Gentile sinners are out here. Now, Paul... Formerly in here, within the law, avoiding contact with Gentile sinners, um, is basically staying within the fortress, keeping his purity. Uh, What he realized in Christ is that Christ has broken down these barriers between Jews and Gentiles. And so, where, where is Christ located? There's a sense in which Christ is located here. I mean, he is he's building together one new family in Christ that's multi-ethnic and multinational. That's a problem if you are stuck within the fortress because Christ is breaking these boundaries. In fact, we probably could just put the cross completely outside. Um, and because what Paul has done is he has broken down this fortress so that he can be out here where Jesus is. Peter has also broken down that barrier. Remember, we had that episode uh, in Acts 10 and 11. And and also, he's come to Antioch, and he's been eating with Gentiles. So he has left to be where Jesus is, out there among Gentile sinners, where also Jews in Christ are, because it's no problem to be out there. Jews in Christ, Gentile sinners, all one big happy family. Now, what Peter is afraid of, and the Jewish Christians are afraid of, is they don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with these Gentile sinners. That's going to make them unclean. So they're staying within the fortress. And Paul is saying, this this does something far worse for you. It makes you a transgressor. Why does it make you a transgressor? Here's why. Paul is saying, if I have gone out here now, which I did, Peter, I've been eating with Gentiles, You also did, Peter. You were eating with Gentiles. If I have gone out here realizing that this can be torn down, what keeps me within these boundaries can be torn down so I can be where Christ is among sinners, people I thought were sinners. If I've torn that down and then I then rebuild it, I'm a transgressor. Because here's what I'm doing. I'm already out here. This is me and you, Peter. This is Peter and Paul. If I now say... From a, from a position out here, it's necessary, if I now say it is necessary to remain within the fortress to be justified before Christ, well, I'm already out. So what I am doing, and this is what Paul wants Peter to understand, 
Peter, you are holding to two mutually contradictory positions. You are saying, uh, by your life, you need to be outside with Gentiles. And you're saying you, you can't be outside with Gentiles. You're saying you have to remain within and you've already left it. So you, you basically reveal yourself to not be a sinner, but to be a transgressor of the law. Somebody who, who, somebody who purposefully just steps over the line of what the law teaches, you become a transgressor. So, you're basically saying that salvation is only among those who participate in a Jewish identity and it's among those who participate among the Gentiles. You can't have it both ways. It's mutually incoherent. That is the logic of verse 18. Peter, I know you're trying to avoid being a sinner. If you go back and you, you, you've shrunk away from fellowship with the Gentiles, if you do that, you actually are, you are a transgressor. Uh, so that's his first argument. His first argument is just a way of saying, actually, it's far worse if you do what you do, Peter. And then in verses 19 to 20, Paul is going to explain the logic of why he can actually fellowship with sinners and it's not a big deal. Um, and he's going to explain kind of the underlying logic to everything that's going on in this whole passage. Uh, where he says in verse 18, uh, second explanation set off by a four, for through the law I died to the law that I might live to God. What is he saying there? Um, I think that Paul is still working with the same notion, this notion of the law as a fortress that calls for the death of anybody who transgresses. Um, there's a difference between, between you know, a trans, a intentional transgression of the law's boundaries in the Old Testament and um, you know, everyday sins like, you know, that could be atoned for. Um, but the law requires death of transgressors. It is, it is basically this fortress, and the only way out is death. So Paul is saying through that mechanism of the law, through the law, through the law's own mechanism, I actually died to the law. And he goes on to explain that in verse 20. Because he has already died, because he's been co-crucified with Christ. Uh, he is dead and he died with Christ. So he died to that old world, and he's also died to this, the version of Judaism that regards, uh, that regards it as being unlawful to actually leave this fortress and go out and, and fellowship with uh, Gentile sinners. So for Paul, the theologic that gets him out here, fellowship with, with sinners, is being co-crucified with Christ. You can put Paul's name on there. He does not have to worry about transgressing any boundaries, uh, and he doesn't have to worry about fellowshipping with sinners because he's dead. So he doesn't, he doesn't abide by this reality anymore, which gives them their label, and he's not bound to remain within it anymore. Uh, which, going back to verse 19 briefly, allows him to truly live to God. Because what God is currently doing is building this multinational, multi-ethnic community this multi-ethnic family, and Paul's full participation in that is his being alive to God. And it's the law's own mechanism that allowed him to do that um, by virtue of his co-crucifixion in and with Christ. So by virtue of Paul's inclusion in the death of Christ, he makes his way out from that ex exclusive fortress to a place where he, he can now be fully participating with Gentiles. Um, so let's, let's uh, make our way through the rest of verse 20 here. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. That is to say, it's no longer that, um, that constructed Paul and all his achievements and his social status that he had built uh, in a culture that was Torah-based. Um, that person is dead. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I don't live by virtue of remaining within a Jewish culture to earn uh, you know, social status among my peers. Uh, 
I now live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, so empowered by Jesus himself. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So Paul no longer uh, lives a life of coercion. He no longer lives a life of maintaining these boundaries. He now has left it, and he lives a life that imitates Jesus' life of self-giving love and, uh, well, actually of self-giving love, those two elements, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And that loving and delivering himself up for sets the trajectory for Paul to live a life of loving others and giving himself up for them. So I hope that that logic makes sense. Um, that is to say that it makes sense of what Paul is arguing here. How he gets out of this, of this uh, fortress kind of structure is by dying. Because leaving it requires a death. If he's already dead, there's not anything to worry about. Um, going back to this... Um, sort of uh, scenario in which we can imagine you know, the present evil age. Um, this is, a, this is a, um, a realm of exclusion. This is a realm of pushing out sinners. This is a realm of establishing my identity as better than others. So um, identifying sinners, others as sinners, as tainted or bad or worthless or relatively worthless, those are all behaviors, attitudes, actions, social dynamics that come from a corrupted uh, cosmic realm, the present evil age. And by virtue of the death of Christ, we are delivered into the new creation, uh, which takes on the character of Christ himself, oriented by love, uh, self-giving, oriented by inclusion. So, uh, rich, poor, male, female, Jew, Greek. I mean, in Christ is this radical dimension of inclusive attitudes and behaviors. So we never, uh, from Paul's perspective, uh, Jewish Christians don't look at non-Jewish Christians and label them sinners, uh, less valuable than, anything like that. We see ourselves as siblings uh, in the new family that God is building in Christ. Um, no more excluding others. Um, no, more, um, no more sort of, um, remember that the dynamic whereby Paul was trying to work for the purification of Judaism. Now there's a radical going out so that people formerly regarded as dangerous are now friends. So it's a radically different kind of a, uh, uh, a way of life and, and a community way of life. Um, This is, um, this is really the realm of resurrection, and this is the realm uh, that in Paul's theology will eventually become the kingdom of God in the future. This is the realm that's going down to destruction and is coming apart and will ultimately be destroyed at the day of Christ. And um, so this, like I said, this is the realm that is going to move into the new creation, and this helps to make sense of... Um, verse 21, because this is the realm of rectification slash justification. This is the made right realm, the realm of uh, being justified before God, which helps to make sense of verse 21. When Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Uh, and I think that what Paul is trying to get at there is he's saying um, he's not nullifying God's grace. In fact, seeing, um, um, seeing any other way as being able to actually produce this reality, the new creation, the realm of rectification, if any other way could produce that, um, that would be a claim that God's grace is working in some other way. Paul's not nullifying God's grace. He's actually saying only the cross brought this about. Only faith in Christ enables participation in it. If it was brought about by the law, by Jewish identity, or if you could participate in it by being a Jew, 
then Christ, like God was absurdly cruel for sending Christ to die because it could have been done some other way. The only way that this new creation reality can be created is by the cross. And the only way to participate in it is by faith in Christ. So Paul is actually, this is sort of a way of saying something positively by saying it negatively. I do not nullify the grace of God. Paul is actually proclaiming the grace of God. This is how God's power works. It doesn't work by some earthly, earthbound agenda. Uh, one final comment I'd like to make, and that is in uh, sort of a spiritual life, so spiritual self-regard notion. Um, when Paul uh, says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, um, please don't think about that in terms of um, a false uh, kind of John the Baptist kind of spirituality. I've heard um, a lot of folks use this statement and then also John the Baptist statement, I must decrease that he must increase. Um, please understand that John the Baptist is talking about a sequence. You know, it's, he, he had a crucial role on the stage of God's redemptive work. Now it's time for him to take a step back. But that's not the kind of statement that should govern everybody's spirituality. And when Paul says here, um, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, it is not the case that um, I, as an individual, must diminish so that Christ is magnified. What, I mean, Paul is making a contrast here between a falsely constructed self, who I thought I was. Who I thought I was was who my culture told me I was. Who I thought I was was who I thought I was in the esteem of my peers. That self is dead. Uh, the self that excluded others, the self that mistreated others, the self that coerced others, the self that sought power over others, that self is dead. It's on the cross. And it's not that no, um, I'm abolished and Christ just takes over. By virtue of Christ being in me and me being absorbed into Christ by the Spirit, I become who I finally am. I become my truest self. So Christ living in me, me being absorbed into the faithfulness of the Son of God, um, makes me who I finally and fully am. And what I mean by that is this. Um, I now can think about, um, because I'm set free and fully loved in Christ, I can actually think about uh, all of my skills and abilities and be really honest. Um, because I can think about what, what do I contribute well to a community? Uh, where can I maximize my time? Uh, what am I not so great at? Where do I, where do I need others? I can be fully honest about that because none of those behaviors, none of those stations I might occupy in my church, none of that determines my value. I am fully loved in Christ. Here, on a corrupted conception, I have to be the teacher, I have to be the leader, I have to be the director, I have to be the guy in charge, whatever, because then I'm more valuable. That's a world that's dead now. And I can be a follower, I can be a participant. I can be at times directing something, but I can be someone who takes orders. It doesn't matter because I'm one of a number of people who are fully loved in Christ. Um, I become who I finally am. I become who I truly am in my marriage. Uh, I don't have to fight for turf. Um, I can listen. Uh, we can have roles kind of switch around in the home as far as functionality uh, based on what's best for all of us. Knowing that the more of a servant I am, the more I receive, the more I listen, um, the more I engage in self-giving love, the more those behaviors are generative of resurrection presence in my home. Um, I've thought loads about this with regard to um, uh, how to participate on a faculty um, where sometimes turf warfare breaks out. Um, but Christian identity and me becoming who I truly and fully and finally am uh, offers so much hope and so much promise in so many areas of life. When we think about taking um, the shape of the cross in our conversation, in our relational dynamics, in our postures toward others, and as a community, uh, as, a, as the 
with regard to the posture that the church takes to the wider culture, we begin to radiate God's love and enjoy for ourselves more of God's presence. Um, but that usually means giving up power, um, giving up power pursuits and, and coercion and power grabbing and taking on postures of hospitality, service, and self-giving love. So just to say, when it comes to thinking about embodying Christian behavior, we're not um, canceling ourselves and letting Jesus you know, be on display. We're putting to death false conceptions of ourselves and determining how, like Paul, my body, my, my social relationships, how can my body be a sight that reveals Jesus? And that means me becoming who I truly and fully am. And that goes a little way towards explaining um, how it is that uh, Christian liberty and freedom can be fully inhabited. Because that truly is a freeing reality. So, the theological logic that Paul unfolds uh, for Peter and for the Jewish Christians who are there in Galatia, having everything to do with inhabiting the death of Christ and how that brings about the creation of a radically new uh, world, uh, where God is building his multinational people made up of all ethnicities uh, in Christ. The heart of the letter that we're going to see worked out uh, throughout the rest of uh, Galatians. This is Dr. Tim Gambus in his teaching on the book of Galatians. This is session number four on Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. 